Good morning, LSA, and welcome to church. As we approach March break, we wanted to let you know that we will be taking a pause from all of our kids and youth programming during that week. We encourage families to take the opportunity to enjoy time with one another and find rest. As we look forward to the end of March, we are pleased to announce that we are going to be hosting an egg hunt here at the church on March 29th. This will be a fun-filled event for all ages, so we hope to see you there. Additionally, we are excited to announce a new relationship study called Love, Dates, and Heartbreaks, starting on March 21st. This is an excellent opportunity for anyone looking to explore or deepen their relationships. You can find out more about this study and all ministries by visiting our website, lsa.church.
Here is where I lay it down Every burden, every crown This is my surrender This is my surrender Here is where I lay it down Every lie and every doubt This is my surrender
ocean starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus, cause your name is God. Jesus, thank you that you are the way out of the dark. Thank you that your light is available to all of us and help us to be that light for others when they are in the darkness. We pray for this service, Lord. You know the tuning of every heart in this room, and we just ask for a recalibration, that we would just be in sync with you. As we bring our talents and times and treasures to you as an offering, we ask that you would just do your work. We anticipate the miracles, the amazing things that you will put our hearts to use in the world to do in those dark places. We thank you for all of these things together, and we just worship and love you in your name, and we say your name together, Jesus. Amen.
We live in a world filled with turmoil and doubt. But there was a man who brought hope and peace. A man who performed acts that defy explanation, revealing the power of the divine. This man was Jesus, the Son of God. The Bible records the accounts of his healings and resurrections, how he provided for the masses and his mastery over the elements. They have been recorded and cherished throughout history, igniting faith and inspiration in countless individuals. But it's not just the miracles that make Jesus so significant. It's the message he brought to the world, a message of love, grace, and redemption. He taught us to love unconditionally, to care for the marginalized, and to prioritize the will of God above all else. It is imperative that we remember Jesus and the wonders he performed, not just as stories, but as a testament to the love and the might of our God, to understand that no matter how trying the circumstances may be, the light of the gospel still shines bright. For in knowing Jesus, we know true hope, and through him, we have the ability to transform the world. Good morning. The song that we just finished singing is so perfect for what I want to talk to you about right now. We've had some really tough years these past few years. The pandemic and the turmoil that it has brought, and now we see rising inflation and that worries us, and we see wars around the world. It's a frightening time. And sometimes, as we talk with our friends, um, I've heard lately some people say something, we should have prayer meetings. And we kind of go, yeah, we should. Well, we've decided, yes, we are. This coming Thursday night at 7 o'clock, there's going to be a prayer meeting here at the church in the new chapel that's just back there, kind of just off the foyer. Um, staff in session also agreed that this would be a good thing that we get together to pray. If for any reason it turns out that every single one of you shows up, and that would be amazing and wonderful, we'll just move from where we were going to have it in the new chapel, just across over to the kids' meeting room. House, room. But we do want everyone to really consider coming on Thursday night for a prayer meeting. I thought we'd tell you a little bit about how it's going to work. Those, it'll start with a very short devotion, and then there's going to be a quiet prayer time but it will be sort of led because someone will be telling you, let's pray for LSA Church or let's pray for our families. We understand that there are some of you who think, oh, going to a prayer meeting, like I don't like praying out loud, that makes me really nervous. Well, this part of the prayer meeting will be a quiet one where we'll guide you that you pray quietly. And there'll also be a time when people can speak out loud and pray out loud as well. We're going to be giving you some prayer lists of um, all kinds of things that you can pray for, for our church and our community. You also can fill out prayer cards. There are some prayer cards that are back in the chapel, um, sitting on a, a chair that used to be on the platform years and years and years ago at the old church. Um, you can go in there, fill out the prayer card, and put it in the box that's sitting on that chair, and we will pray for you. You can also come and fill out prayer cards that night. You can even come during the week, because that chapel is a place of prayer. And you can pray, you can leave prayer requests. But whatever we do, when we get together on Thursday night, we want to pray for this church, for our community, for each other, so that we know that we're a family who are together and lifting ourselves up to the Lord. There's a verse that I just love about this, because it sort of is the basis of why I pray. Philippians 4, 16, or 4, 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Uh, let's pray for our prayer night. 
And also, um, just uh, I'm thankful for the people that have put this together. You know, as a, as a pastor, sometimes you feel like you're driving a lot of the new initiatives. This initiative is coming uh, from Audrey, from Jan, and from a few others who have been really thinking about this. So uh, let's pray over that right now. Mm. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you have put on the hearts of faithful believers uh, this desire to pray. Lord, we see around the world, we see particularly around our country and, and the, the country south of us, Lord, that uh, something is happening. There's a spiritual move that is going on, Lord, and we connect to that through prayer. So, Lord, I just pray that as we are connecting into a bigger movement that you have happening right now, Lord, that we would uh, really join in together in prayer and that you would continue to guide these wonderful leaders and their passion for prayer. Lord, that they wouldn't let it go and they would keep encouraging us uh, to follow in this way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as uh, you know, I've been continuing to go to school, and uh, we have been calling on pastors to come and to preach here at our church. Now, there was one particular person that I was really hoping would come, but he's, he's a very active person who's out uh, doing a lot of preaching and is overseeing a lot of, of ministry. So I thought, oh, I'm not sure if it's going to happen, but I prayed that it did. And it did happen. He did get back to us. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Garth Lino uh, is here with us today. He was the senior pastor of the Gathering Church here in Windsor until eight months ago when he completed almost nine years of ministry uh, in that church. Garth and his wife Patty started a Saturday night Bible study in their home in the fall of 2013, and God blessed it. It grew steadily. The following year, along with some close friends, the Linos planted the Gathering Church, which many of you will have heard of. It soon became affiliated with the SEND Network and the Canadian National Baptist Convention. Garth was sharing just before uh, the service here that it was really important for them to get connected, to have, to not go it alone, but to have a group of people they were affiliating with. And there creates, it's hard sometimes, you know, when we've had a hard experience or things haven't gone well, we start wanting to isolate. And that's not a good thing. We need accountability. We need these good things. And they know, recognize that and have become part of that convention. Since July, Garth has been working part-time with the Canadian National Baptist Convention as the team leader for pastoral care and the Baptist State Convention of Michigan doing much the same thing. He leads an internet, a denominational cohort of pastors in our city here once a month. But most importantly, Garth and Patty are the proud parents of three children and five growing grandkids. And I love that you put that in there, Garth. It always reminds us that our first, in some ways, pastoral duty is to our family, to raise our family in the Lord and to really uh, celebrate what, that gift. So I appreciate you sharing that. Now, just before Pastor Garth comes to preach, uh, let's turn to the uh, scripture that we're, he's going to be preaching from today. Um, it's from the ESV, and we're looking at uh, John chapter 5, verses 46 to 54. Is that, that's correct, right? John chapter 5? John chapter 4. Ooh, I knew there was something wrong about that. John chapter 4, verse 46 to 54. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed, and all his household. 
This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. The word of the Lord read in our midst. Garth. Let me just pray for Garth right now. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this man of God who has followed you over so many years, faithfully doing your work and is continuing to do so. Lord, as he continues to mentor pastors, encourage and pray, and uh, provide care for pastors, Lord, I just pray that you would um, give him uh, many people in his life that are also blessing him and uh, supporting him. Lord, I pray for him and his family. And particularly during this time, I pray that the words coming from his mouth would bring glory to you and would reflect your will for our congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Brian. Thank you. And good morning, Lakeshore. So good to be with you again. It's been a very long time since we were in your house. Thank you for the very warm welcome you've given us this morning. This story at the end of John chapter 4 uh, the Pastor Brian read, is a very interesting vignette in the life of Jesus and his disciples. Earlier in the Gospel of John, in chapter 3, you'll recall that Jesus has this uh, amazing conversation with a Jewish Pharisee named Nicodemus, who came to him at night. And then a little while later, at the beginning of John chapter 4, Jesus has a conversation with a woman, a Samaritan woman, about water and living water and never being thirsty again. Then you come to the end of John chapter 4, and there's a, a healing that takes place of a Roman Gentile official's son. So in John 3 and 4, you have Jesus interacting with a Jewish Pharisee and then a Samaritan woman and now a Gentile Roman official, which is proof again that the gospel, the good news of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ is for everybody, every tribe, every nation, every people group, every race can relate to this message of love in Jesus Christ. And I feel a certain sense of solidarity with this Roman official, this guy whose son lay sick in Capernaum. <clears throat> this man was desperate when he reached out to Jesus. When he heard that Jesus had come to town, he'd come to Cana, with little regard for his title or position or Roman power structures, he humbled himself and went to see Jesus and, and came to Jesus and begged Jesus to heal his son who was near death. I've been there. I've been that desperate in my life, and maybe you have too. Verse 46 tells us this man was a royal official. Now, the word used here indicates that he was a man of great influence and, and power and authority, probably a, an important man in the Roman government structures. He, he possibly had everything that a man could ever want except for one thing his son, maybe his only son, was sick, close to death, desperately ill. He'd come down with a fever of sorts, and, and he took a turn for the worse. And there is nothing in this life like watching your child take a turn for the worse. Years ago, when our middle child, Jamie, was in hospital, after a critical surgery, her lung collapsed. And she had many other medical complications, but she went from bad to worse in, in a matter of minutes. And all of a sudden, there was a flurry of doctors and nurses and specialists and orderlies and everybody else running around in a flurry trying to look after her. One of them gently pulled us aside to prepare us for the worst. One author says, nothing can shatter us more quickly or more completely than affliction falling upon our children. Isn't that the truth? I think I understand how this royal official felt. 
He wanted nothing more, nothing less than for Jesus to do something for his son. He wanted his son to be strong and healthy again. So the need of his heart was intense, a great need. Verse 47, when this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. The word begged literally means that he, he started to beg and kept on begging. He would not stop. I, I picture this man, this nobleman, kneeling before uh, Jesus, kneeling at his feet and crying out to him and begging him to heal his son. Repeatedly, he just kept begging and begging and begging and begging and begging Jesus to do something for him, for his son. He was completely indifferent to the noise around him. He didn't give a rip what anybody thought of him or what anybody was saying behind his back. He didn't care because the health of his son was at stake. You and I would do the same, wouldn't we? He was desperately pleading for his son's health. And how does Jesus respond? The response of Jesus here is rather startling, I must say. Verse 48, unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, you will never believe. Well, what's up with that? It, it just sounds like a, a rather cold, stark, startling response to a man whose heart is broken, to a man who's pleading for grace and mercy, who's deeply concerned about his son. The text says he was close to death. The man is pouring out his heart to the Lord, begging repeatedly for help, and it's like Jesus just throws a glass of ice water in his face. But as C.S. Lewis once observed, the hardness of God is kinder than the softness of man, and his compulsion is our liberation. But before we judge Jesus' words too harshly, we need to remember that there was a circus atmosphere uh, developing around Jesus. I mean, to many people, he was fast becoming the big attraction in Israel. He was the traveling sideshow. Step right up, step right up, come and see the miracle worker. It started to feel like and sound like a circus. They flocked to his side. They were curious to see what he would do or what he would say next. He was the, he was the flavor of the month. He was the big ticket of the week. They seemed to want a Messiah who will perform miracles to order. They, they seemed to focus on the signs and wonders that he was performing instead of the miracle worker himself. Even today, <laughs> even today, those who constantly seek signs and wonders and favors and miracles from God to confirm their faith may be missing the intent of these things. If we fixate on the on, 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 on sensationalism and, and we're, we're always looking for the miraculous, we may miss Jesus. We may fail to see him as he passes by. And, and as it turns out, <clears throat> Jesus' penetrating words to this nobleman in verse 48 were not so much a rebuke in my opinion, as they were the beginning of grace in his life. Verse 49, the royal official said, Sir, come down before my son dies. Remember, this official is from Capernaum. He's come to Cana because he heard about Jesus doing all these magnificent things. So come down. Come down to Capernaum before my child dies. Again, interesting response. He doesn't deny what Jesus said. He doesn't 
defend himself. He, he, he simply keeps pleading for help. He, he's, he's desperate for the grace of God. I mean, he's, he's wrung out. He's desperate for God's grace. Have you ever been desperate for God's grace? Have you ever been so desperate for God? If so, then you, you, you understand this, man. You, you get why he won't leave Jesus alone. He keeps begging because Jesus was his last hope. I got news for you. He's your last hope too. He's, Jesus is my last hope. He's your last hope. He's our last hope. Jesus is our hope. Verse 50, Jesus told him, go back home. Your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. <laughs> Notice that Jesus grants the healing but he doesn't go down to Capernaum. Go back home, he said. Your son will live. So it, it was a healing at a distance. He was 20 miles away from Capernaum when he spoke those words, and that boy was healed. It's healing at a distance. And he gave the man no sign. He gave him no sworn affidavit. There was no war warranty or, or guarantee. The only thing he gave this man was his word. Is his word good enough for you? Do you need a sign, a wonder? Do you need a healing to believe and trust and follow Jesus? All he gave him was his word. Our gracious Savior was attempting to, to lift this man's faith into the realm of the supernatural. He wanted his faith to be a, a living faith, a, a deeper faith, a, a better faith, a higher faith based on the spoken word of God. Is that good enough for you? He wants nothing less for us. Go back home your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and left. There was no argument, no pleading, no insistence on one little sign or maybe a, a tiny confirmation as he walked away. No. He, the man just took Jesus at his word and departed. Something radical Something radical happened in this guy's heart that I wish would happen to everyone here today. He left the presence of Jesus absolutely assured that the words of Jesus form a promise. And I wish that, I pray that for us today, that we would be absolutely convinced that the word of God is a promise word to each one of us. And in that promise, he rested. He relaxed in the promise of God. He, he relied on the promise of God. And, and right here, the story takes another interesting twist. We look at verse 51. While he was still on the way back home to Capernaum, his, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday, yesterday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, the fever left him. Now, Cana and Capernaum are only 20 miles apart. The healing took place in Cana at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Easily, this official could have made it back home to Capernaum in five or six hours, walking. He, he could have been there before dark. <laughs> I, I would have thought that he'd be super eager to see his boy. Jesus said, he'll be well, I'm, I'm, I'm there, I'm going, right now. I, I can't walk fast enough, I can't get there fast enough. Maybe I'll steal a donkey on the way. I gotta get there to see my boy. But this father had so much confidence in the spoken word, the promise of God, the words that Jesus spoke, that he stayed overnight in Cana. 
He didn't go home that night. He stayed overnight in Cana and didn't return till the next day because the text tells us that while he was still on the way home, his servants met him with the good news. The boy's alive. Ha! Ah, it's healing at a distance. See, the world says seeing is believing. But for those of us who follow Jesus, believing is seeing. Because we live by faith and not by sight. Isn't that right? So let's talk about the overflow of all of this for just a moment. What flows out of this healing at a distance? What comes next? Well, let's look at verse 53. Then the father realized that this was the very time Jesus had told him, your son will live. And he and his entire household believed in Jesus. See, the healing not only caused excitement on the road between Cana and Capernaum when the servants came out and said, Master, your son's alive, hallelujah! Is that okay to do that in this church? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it started, not only did it cause excitement on the road, it started a revival at home. Look, there was an outburst of faith in Capernaum. And that, my friends, is always a miracle. No matter when and where and how it happens. Salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ, in his perfect life, his perfect death, and his resurrection is always a miracle. The new birth is always a miracle. Every time it takes place, do you believe that? Salvation by faith. The greatest miracle of all. And so when this guy got home and he heard that his son was well, he shared with them what he'd experienced, what he'd heard, what he'd seen, what he'd smelt, what he, what he tasted on, on his trip to Cana, and his entire household believed. And we're not told how old his children were, uh, how old this man was, you know, whether there were servants in the home or whatever, but his whole household believed. That is part of the miracle that is taking place in John chapter 4. Let's not miss it. And it's all very exciting, isn't it? I mean, what, what a great story of faith. What a wonderful testimony of conversion to, to Jesus Christ. But not every story ends that way. We know that not every story like this has a happy ending. Not every cry for healing, whether it be physical or emotional healing or relationships or whatever, not every cry for healing ends the way this one did. When Dick Peterson's wife, Elizabeth, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, he knew that many challenges awaited his family. What he didn't know was just how many lessons he would learn along the way. This is what he wrote about his journey. Allow me just to read it to you this morning. Dick wrote, Elizabeth's disease became my disease and made demands on our relationship we were ill-prepared to manage. As she moved from cane to walker to electric scooter and finally to a powered wheelchair, I had to adjust my life to fit her needs. Uninvited and unwelcomed, this disease now forces us into a, a sick kind of reality game, leaving no choice but to follow the rules even as they change and become more restrictive. This multiple sclerosis is not at all fair, but we have the choice to let it tear us apart or use it to strengthen our marriage bond as we face the adversity together. Even as this disease steals abilities from Elizabeth, Dick said, a healing grows almost undetected inside. When we talk about this, Elizabeth wonders aloud, did it really take this to teach me that my soul is more important to God than my body? And I ask, is this what Jesus meant when he taught his disciples to serve? When he washed their feet, was he looking 2,000 years down into the future and, and, and to, to see me washing my wife's clothes and helping her bathe? Did it really take this to teach me compassion? 
We pray that Elizabeth will resume her old life. Jesus wants her to assume a new life. We long for change on the outside. Jesus desires change on the inside. We pray for what we want. Jesus answers with what we need. And then in the the closing lines of his article, Dick writes these words, makes a powerful statement. He said, each and every day we learn forceful lessons on submission, dependence, service, and a love that endures all things and never fails. What a powerful, what a powerful testimony of the sustaining grace of God. And don't we need that? Every single day. We need the same miracle of sustaining, enduring grace. Now, you may live with a child with disabilities, or you may live with a cancer diagnosis, or you may live with a crumbling marriage, or or failing grades at school. Don't you need that sustaining grace? Don't you need the healing work of God in your life? So what, what should we do? I mean, what what should we do if we have a physical need? What what if we do? What what should we do if if we're emotionally distraught? What should we do if a a relationship is broken and there doesn't seem to be any hope? What should we do when we long for healing of any kind? What should we do? Back to this guy in verse 47. When this man heard, that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him repeatedly to come and heal his son who was close to death. What should we do? We should run to Jesus. We should make room in our lives for God to do what only God can do. We should run to him. Every time we should run to him and come to him and fall at his feet and beg him over and over again to do what only he can do. This is a pattern in the New Testament over and over and over again. Full, complete surrender to God. He's the great physician. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the branch of Jesse. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the desire of ages. He is Emmanuel. He's the great hallelujah. He is the, he is the alpha and omega. He's the righteous root of Jesse. He is everything. And we should run to him. That's what we should do. And, and, and like he did in John chapter 4, Jesus may speak a word of healing, and in that very instant there's change. Or he may choose to allow the healing to take an altogether different route, teaching us forceful lessons on submission and obedience and dependence and service and about a love that endures all things and bears all things. On a personal note, just under a year after our own daughter, Jamie, died, the end of March last year, I'm learning to say with the prophet Habakkuk, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty yet I will rejoice in the Lord I will be joyful in the God of my salvation that my friends is a choice I will be joyful in the God of of my salvation. Just give me Jesus. I, 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 love, I love to see healing up close. And, and by the grace of God, I, I, I've seen that happen. And, and I love to witness signs and wonders. 
and, and my travels all over the, the world in the last uh, 30 years or so, I've seen amazing things. I love to sit on the front row seat and just watch God on stage doing what he does best. I love that. But when everything is said and done, I am satisfied with Jesus. Just give me Jesus. He's enough. And you find, you will find that Jesus is enough when Jesus is all you got. When Jesus is all you got, you, you, you really understand and know that he's enough. If I never see another miracle in this life, I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God the son left the heights of heaven and, and descended to earth to become a man. He, he lived a sinless life and then he willingly went to the cross to die for the sin of Adam's race. And on the third day, he rose again from the grave, and he now sits at the right hand of God the Father. And in his resurrection, he made it possible for everyone who believes to rise again and live forever. And that, my friends, is a story of healing too. In my opinion, there's no greater miracle given among men today than salvation itself. And every other miracle that follows salvation is just a bonus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the outrageous grace and favor that you bestow upon your people. Lord God, we thank you today for this amazing story at the end of John chapter 4. A, a rather unusual story in the life and ministry of Jesus, but not so. We identify with this story. We see ourselves in this story because many of us here today are desperate for grace. And so we come begging. Lord, we we fall at your feet and ask you to show us your face once again. Show us your power. Open up the heavens. Let the glory of God fall upon your people again this morning. Whether it be a, a cancer diagnosis or difficult circumstances at home or a crumbling marriage, whatever the circumstances may be, Lord, we speak Jesus over all of that and pray for your healing power to fall again from heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
God his son not sparing Send him to die I scarce can take it That on that cross My burden gladly bearing He bled and died To take away my sin And sings my soul and teaching time this morning here at Lakeshore. My prayer for you this morning is that God will do for you what you need done in your life. Sometimes we don't even know what we need. God knows best. And so we pray on a daily basis, Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we need to make room in our lives for God to do whatever he wants to do. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Have a great week.